uh, Basilia Aria. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Are you around? Uh, yeah, that's all right. Um, hi. <laughs> Let me okay. uh, try to start sharing my screen. Um, sorry. Sorry. Um, okay. Can you all see my screen okay? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, so you have 25 minutes. Hi, everyone. Uh, great, thanks. Um, so I'm um, Bashal Yadja, um, and I'm a postdoc down at the Australian National University in Canberra. And it's an absolute pleasure um, to present some of the Osgraph progress and achievements that we have um, with regards to uh, NEMO, which is a kilohertz band gravitational wave detector concept. Um, Osgraph, for all of you who haven't heard of this before, um, is an Australian Research Council um, Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. And it's a collaboration between uh, various Australian universities, some of which are listed down here um, below. Um, today, I'll present some of the design aspects and the science case um, for a kilohertz band uh, gravitational frequency um, detector concept that we fondly call um, NEMO, or which stands for Neutron Star Extreme Matter Observatory. And um, before we get into the talk, though, um, there's this little um, square on the corner of the slide um, where if the Zoom view is blocking anything, you can just pop my um, video there. Um, and I promise there's no information here on any of the slides that'll be compromised. Um, before getting into the talk, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we are located, meet and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, gravitational waves from uh, merging neutron stars, which are typically in the kilohertz regime, carry a wealth of information about nuclear matter at extreme conditions. Um, kilohertz gravitational waves are a direct way of probing the remnants of these mergers. And these are really interesting objects because they're, they're kind of the only one of the few places in the universe that provide us with um, access to what I like to think of as a beautiful astrophysical laboratories um, because they look at this um, extremely high density and low temperature um, regime, which is currently not produced um, in any of the terrestrial particle colliders. And that's what this temperature um, density phase diagram is trying to talk about. And this is where we kind of expect NEMO's um, sensitivity to deliver the highest amount of science. Um, before I present the science case for NEMO specifically, um, let's quickly look through the different pathways for um, binary neutron star mergers. And I'll explain why we're interested in this slide very shortly, so please indulge me for now. Um, if we were to start with two very distinct objects and move towards the merger phase, then there's a couple of different scenarios that can play out um, depending on the uh, um, initial masses of the components involved. For example, they could um, promptly collapse into a black hole with an accretion torus, differentially rotating neutron star, um, which could then, um, if it was a hypermassive neutron star, collapse into a black hole, or if it's a supermassive neutron star, um, it first turns into this intermediate object, um, which can then transform into a stable neutron star or a black hole of longer time scales. The arrows that are shown here. Um, show the suspected pathway scenario um, for the very famous um, TW170817, which probably ended up as a hypermassive neutron star. This, this is one of the largest multi-messenger events in um, recent times and um, started with the detection um, from the merger of two neutron stars by the LIGO Virgo detectors. And there was also a lot of um, electromagnetic follow-up associated with this particular event. So if we have a look at the spectrogram um, that you see here on the bottom um, from, one of the LIGO, from the, one of the LIGO detectors, we can see that we don't resolve the chirp, the very typical chirp very well. Um, but if we, were, if, if we were to be able to resolve this and see all of it, then we would be able to learn more things like about, especially about the tidal deformability or put tighter constraints on the equation of states of the neutron stars. This is the reason we were unable to completely resolve this is because uh, the sensitivity of the current detectors starts rolling up in the kilohertz frequencies, or in other words, we're just not sensitive enough. 
Um, using these neutron stars as the science case motivation, we've designed the NEMO concept with a noise budget that kind of looks like this, so the, shown in black here, is the NEMO sensitivity curve. And we compare that to the sensitivity of um, the advanced LIGO detector, um, which will come online um, very soon, which is called A+, which utilizes a frequency dependent um, squeeze state injection to improve the overall sensitivity of the detector. And you can see in the kilohertz regime, the sensitivity of the detector is just rolling up. And for NEMO, that is the target band. We also compare the sensitivity to um, the Einstein telescope, which is a planned um, third generation detector in um, Europe, and also to Cosmic Explorer, which is a American third generation detector concept. Um, also shown in red here is the characteristic, um, is the predicted characteristic um, gravitational wave strain for a typical binary neutron star in spiral merger and post merger. Um, and this is about this is for a source that's about 40 megaparsecs away, so similar to GW seventeen oh eight one seven, and the post merger um, signal is derived from numerical relativity um, modeling. Also shown here is um, Nemo from a Disney Pixar movie, <laughs> Nemo, and he aptly calls uh, the Great Barrier Reef his home. It's a very cute story. Um, all of the results that I am presenting presenting today is the work of the entire collaboration. Um, and we have written a paper, um, which has most of the plots that I will be presenting. And uh, I've linked that um, over here for you if you're, if, you're more, if you're interested in finding out more information. Um, so NEMO is envisioned to be a part of a global heterogeneous network of detectors. For example, in the advanced LIGO um, in the A plus era, um, the A-plus detectors could provide the localization that we need, uh, but the NEMO detector could measure uh, the merger and post-merger signals from merging binary neutron stars. And the increased sensitivity that we get from NEMO at the kilohertz regime allows us to, um, one, constrain the equation of state at two very different temperature regimes, uh, temperature extremes for neutron stars, um, mainly like cold during the in-spiral or hot during the merger. But on their own, if these A-plus detectors were uh, to detect uh, one post-merger remnant, then they would have to observe for quite some amount of years, for quite some amount of time. But with NEMO added to the network, the rate of detection of this sort of an event goes up from one to a few per year. And that's what this plot is trying to show here. So in blue, we have the A plus detectors and in black is um, a NEMO, which is located in Australia, uh, added into this network. Also shown here in the bottom is um, uh, the benefit of having a NEMO in this A plus network um, in the reconstruction of the post-merger gravitational wave signal. So now that we have a science case, how do we go from building, how do we go from here to building a detector that meets all of the necessary requirements and to be able to do this cool kilohertz science? So we started by um, assuming a activity of uh, 10 to the minus 24 per root hertz between um, one and three kilohertz. So that's this bandwidth that you see here. And we had a vision that this sort of a detector could be operational in the third generation um, era or maybe even sooner. Um, just to reiterate what NEMO is, it's the Neutron Star Extreme Matter Observatory. And the key topics that we uh, picked up on while we were coming up with this concept were what should the bandwidth of this uh, detector be? What sort of peak sensitivity should we expect? Do we want any tunability of this peak sensitivity? What sort of laser powers should we consider if we were to be injecting squeezing into this interferometer to improve its sensitivity? What sort of levels can we expect uh, given uh, the amount of losses in current detectors? Um, what sort of mirrors should we be using um, such that they don't have very high thermal contributions? And of course, what sort of sites should we be looking at? We did all of these studies, um, uh, we did the first version of all of these studies by assuming uh, we will have a very large network of um, detectors around the world. Um, so starting with the ideas that already existed, um, such as uh, Cosmic Explorer and Voyager, which are all planned detectors, 
we assumed the base wavelength to be about two micron and the arm cavities um, that were designed to have about four and a half megawatts. So we used the vanilla um, dual recycle Fabry Perot configuration, Fabry Perot Michelson interferometer configuration, and we added a couple of bells and whistles to get to that kilohertz sensitivity. Um, what we also did was, um, in order to benefit from the coupled cavity uh, formed by the differential mode of the um, arm cavities and this signal recycling cavity, we modified that such that we have this peak sensitivity in the 900 hertz to 3 kilohertz range, because that's where the sensitivity of the current detectors is rolling up. Um, we also, because we're using such large circulating powers in the arms, uh, we also um, uh, we also went for um, thermally cooled test, ma uh, so test masses that are cooled um, uh, to 150 Kelvin and, uh, and 123 Kelvin. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail very soon. Um, we also made the assumption that we, because we're looking um, only at the high frequency range, um, we would be uh, able to use slightly simpler suspensions um, um, in order to keep the um, core up isolated from ground motion. Um, we also assumed that the coatings that these um, main mirrors would use would be our gas coatings, but this is not set in stone and this is an active area of research for us. And lastly, as all good gravitational wave detectors, we assume a 7 dB reduction in the overall quantum noise um, from injecting squeeze states into the interferometer. Um, doing all of these um, assumptions and uh, figuring out these ideas, uh, we came up with a total noise budget um, that I showed on the previous slide. And that was a result of the instrument noise budget that you see over here. So all of this is different sorts of noise sources in the interferometer, and they're all calibrated to units of gravitational wave strength. So in this kilohertz um, regime where we want NEMA to be most sensitive, and uh, we're mostly quantum noise limited, uh, with of course the uh, exception of a few pesky violin modes showing up. Um, and we've used a combination of tools like the gravitational wave interferometer noise calculator and finesse to obtain uh, the sort of a plot. And the three things that I will talk about in a bit more detail that set Nemo apart from conventional broadband detectors are the long signal recycling cavity the cooling of the test masses, and these steel suspensions. And the total noise curve that you have been looking at um, so far is actually calculated uh, by taking the uncorrelated sum of all of these noise sources that are present in a gravitational wave detector. Um, so any good gravitational wave detector with its salt tries to optimize the sensitivity and bandwidth to, uh, to a certain set of gravitational wave sources. So in this um, dual recycled fabry perot michelson design of current NEMO or even any of the other detectors such as advanced light or CAGRA, um, the coupled cavity formed by this signal recycling mirror and the arm cavities kind of decides the overall bandwidth of your detector. And by choosing appropriate parameters for this um, signal recycling cavity, so in terms of length and also what sort of transmission we have on this, decides um, what frequencies we will be sent, what frequencies that sort of a dip appears at. Um, this long signal recycling cavity also shows the characteristic splitting of a coupled cavity around the um, interferometer um, laser carrier. Um, so both of, so in, if you think of the envelope of the signal recycling cavity as this um, sort of a function, then both of your signal sidebands are resonantly enhanced um, in this sort of a configuration. There are also alternative configurations. So, so if we had a shorter recycling cavity, uh, like in current detectors, then the same effect um, of being sensitive to certain frequencies can be achieved um, by changing the operating condition of the signal recycling mirror. But, and that's called a detuned signal recycling configuration. And what happens then is you resonantly enhance one um, sideband at the cost of the other. And also there are a couple of other additional technical challenges that are associated with having a detuned signal recycling cavity, um, but most of them can be mitigated. 
Um, because we were looking at keeping um, the interferometer as simple as possible and the and knowing the advantages of this long signal recycling configuration, especially when it comes to quantum noise mitigation techniques, um, uh, we, we went for this configuration because here we would require only one um, filter cavity to rotate the squeeze states that we're injecting into the interferometer such that we can get a complete uh, suppression of quantum noise at all frequencies. Um, and if we were to use this detuned signal recycling configuration that I mentioned, then we would need two of these filter cavities. So we, we try to uh, make sure that we try to do a, an analysis of what gives us best sensitivity and uh, with, with, with existing technologies without too many risks. Um, also, another aspect of this long signal recycling cavity is the fact that um, it is much more tolerant to losses in the interferometer, which is a killer for any sort of uh, squeezed light experiment um, because of its uh, extent, because of the relaxation of the loss per meter number over here. And this is a limitation for current gravitational wave detectors as well. And that's why um, NEMO, the NEMO concept was very, was a, was a nice um, idea. Now the, the suspension uh, system that we were assuming for our optics is a very is much is a much simpler one that reduces both the cost and the complexity of installation and commissioning. And for this reason, we envisage um, the usage of a simple three-stage suspension um, as used in the beam splitter uh, and the auxiliary optics at the, at the LIGO detectors, for example. Um, now for NEMO specifically. There are these violin modes uh, of the last stage of the suspension because it's a triple mirror suspension. Um, and the, the suspension thermal noise affects the sensitivity in the kilohertz band. But our current modeling shows that this is not going to be too much of a problem. And if you're interested in knowing all the gory details about this, there's a paper from um, my colleagues um, that I've linked here. Uh, the other thing that I did mention was the test masses for NEMO will be cooled. Um, and the reason we need to do that is um, we need to mitigate the thermal effects from having really large circulating towers in the arms. Um, and for NEMO, we assume that we will be using silicon test masses. Um, and the consequence of using the silicon test masses is we'll have to go to a different wavelength, but I'll get to that in a minute. And just to give you a um, size estimate of what these test masses could look like, um, for NEMO, we've assumed that these test masses are about 45 centimeters in diameter and um, about um, 20 centimeters thick. Um, we noticed that um, in this study that we were doing, um, uh, we could cool the test masses. We could cool the input test mass of the arm cavity radiatively and this test mass um, conductively. And if you want to know why there's a difference between those two, um, there's a there's a there's a lot more detail covered here, or we can um, we can talk about it offline as well. Um, now, I mentioned that NEMO would use two micron um, as it, NEMO, the NEMO concept currently has used two micron as the operating wavelength. And that's because if we were to use silicon test masses to mitigate um, thermal noise, and but silicon is opaque to 1064 nanometers, which is the current uh, wavelength used in most of the gravitational wave detectors, and so we had to find a new wavelength. And one of the requirements for um, this would be, we have to be able to produce about 500 watts um, of laser power to inject into the interferometer. And so we would require a laser source um, having this high power. And this hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, there are thulium doped fiber lasers that are a very promising candidate uh, to achieve this 500 megawatts which also have very good um, beam quality and a very narrow line width. And so it kind of meets all the requirements for a laser source for NEMO, but it still needs a bit of work. Um, there's been another really interesting um, candidate, uh, which was developed here at ANU uh, by Disha Kapasi and others. And this is essentially an external cavity diode laser, which is a, a gain chip uh, with the grading in litro configuration. And it's currently producing about um, 10 milliwatts for an injection current of 480 milliamps at 1920 nanometers. And the, the plan would be to put this in, put this, put the output of this through an amplifier um, to get up to whatever um, sort of um, power levels we need. 
and currently we will test this with about uh, with the two with two watts in our squeeze light system, which we already have set up at two micron. Um, this is a pretty busy plot, so please bear with me on this one. And all I want to all, all I would like for you to take away from this is we've got this vanilla Nemo curve, which is shown in C green here. And by playing around with the parameters of the signal recycling cavity, uh, be it the tuning of the cavity or the length of the cavity or um, more exotic methods like signal amplification techniques, we could potentially tune this detector to any sort of um, uh, signals five of minutes. interest. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so there are, there are lots of um, alternatives available for us. Um, so where in Australia could we put such a detector? Um, the idea behind doing this sort of a site selection study was to identify infrastructure that could potentially host a longer baseline detector. So not just the NEMA, config, NEMA concept that we have written um, this paper about, but also something long-term. So, and we had to start somewhere as a first step. So the most basic um, filtering criteria for these sites um, was uh, for these reference sites, um, or, or the first parameters that were explored are the volume of earth that need to be dug or excavated to have a flat land profile uh, for over for about 40 kilometers because um, uh, detectors like Cosmic Explorer are assuming a 40 kilometer arm length. Now this candidate site also has requirements such as it should be close to cities and towns, but not too close. And, but these two parameters don't showcase the entire complexity that goes into choosing a candidate site. And there are some other parameters that need to be taken into account, some really important ones that are listed here. Um, and we're currently writing up a site selection um, criteria study that will be published. And because we've been, do we've been discussing um, digging and filling and things like that, I found this really cute Nemo um, picture on the internet that I can't take any credit for. As I mentioned earlier, our focus was to have a kilohertz operating gravitational wave detector and by making this choice, we can cut down on some of the costs associated with suspensions and things like that. And here I've shown a sample and the emphasis is on sample costing um, for a NEMA detector in Australia that could be operational in the 2030s. And the budget for this um, also includes um, any, um, the budget for this also includes a pathfinder that could potentially um, answer any sort of technical questions that are left unanswered. Um, so to conclude, NEMO is a kilohertz um, concept for uh, merging neutron stars and looking at also the post-merger signals from neutron stars. And what we're doing now is we're critically reviewing the design choices that we've made for this NEMO concept in terms of wavelength, coatings, and the actual interferometer design. And we're working towards um, refining this, um, uh, refining the study we've already done. And like I said, this was not just my work, but it's the work of um, a lot of people from Osgrave. And with this, um, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question? Uh, okay, I see no questions on the chat or Mademost. Okay, then uh, perhaps uh, if there is uh, something else, um, it can be posted on Mademost. And I think with this, we conclude the morning session. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Camilo, for sharing this session. And uh, now we reconvene uh, at uh, in uh, half an hour okay with the experimental uh, session on microwave cavities so you mean at 25 oh no right sorry uh, uh half past 12 yeah half past 12